So today we're going to visit the, the synthesis of French Baroque architecture, where beyond just the architecture itself, this is the first time that there's a coalescence between architecture, interior design, and landscape design as well, which ends up being kind of the pinnacle of the French Baroque for residential here. And then we'll see some examples of it in ecclesiastical work, and then we'll see an, an enormous scale change eventually at Versailles. So our title here for our subject matter in model form, as well as the plan and then the perspective we'll draw is Vau, Vau Le Vicomte. It's French Baroque, as I mentioned. It's about uh, an hour's drive southeast of Paris, built between 1658 and 16th. Uh, 61 for the king's financier. And that's critical to realize that if you're the king's financier, you're probably going to make um, a fair salary yourself. And Nicolas Fouquet had earned the right to be that presence of Louis XIV and to try to speculate at his own home out in the southwest region outside of Paris. He hired uh, three great designers, and we'll start with the architect first. Laveau, then for the interiors, the painter Lebrun, and then for the landscape plan, Lenotra. So it's kind of an easy way to remember the three since their last names all begin with Le. So those three came together and coalesced this uh, lovely essay in the restrained French Baroque. And if we look at the front elevation here, in a sense, as you approach from your ride from the city, for instance, it's not really an urban aspect, it's kind of semi-rural out here, but it's got the same type of tripart that we saw the Francois Mansard did at Maison Lafitte, where there's a central axis to it and two wings on either side, so it's an ABA rhythm and the two final edges of it actually crop out too, sort of enhancing the idea of a front court. And when you come into the big hall in the back, this is where Laveau makes his spectacle. In plan type, he creates the big salon and a big oval shape. So we see that the move away from the Renaissance to explore more tertiary types of forms in, in plan as well as in volume to create this new spectacle grand salon. And what makes it even more remarkable by itself on a more normative site, it would have been a jewel of architecture, but now the presence of so the glass walls, the first level of the Grand Salon, looking out toward the spectral of the garden, is what really makes the whole series of the three arts come together on one site for the first time. So, what we're going to look at uh, in specific is the building, but we'll visit and come out to the real spectacle of the gardens of of La Notre. So, if I rotate this around to match the floor plan here. We'll start with that oval shape of the salon, which is sort of the center of everything. That's where the entertainment happens. This is where you greet your guests after they arrive through the front courtier area here. And then once you come here, you've got that sort of um, explosive view across a whole 180 degree plane that takes you down this major axis. And then the play of landscape vertically, horizontally, the play of the actual plantings themselves, the way that he changes perspectival view and creates an, an interesting flow of space throughout the, the landscape garden in the back is the first kind of crowning jewel of the, of the French attempt at this. So Fouquet had purchased and demolished a couple villages to actually um, work on this chateau out in the landscape. But the displaced villagers were then rehired to upkeep and maintain the gardens. And the gardens were so spectacular and so demanding that there might have been as many as 10,000 workers there um, in the course of the summer to prepare this for some of the grand festivals that Fouquet would, would show off the home with. Uh, so the chateau was the inauguration of Volavi Comte and, and, and brought a great artist to it. So if we can draw into it now, we'll start to see the sense of its prominence in the language of French history. So again, the plan type is the standard orthogonal projection 
with that ABA rhythm of the two piers being symmetrical and then B being the entry portico leading toward the great space. So a normative room in the beginning projects you into the spectacle of this great salon. And the salon anchors us into its pros moving back to the garden proper. So it has a series of terraces that break down and lead you towards a bridge that takes you over the first piece of waterway for the moat that goes around the chateau and then leads you down the spine, but then breaks you into a series of great Baroque play and plan of uh, moving you through the forest slash garden slash waterway as a spectacle of design language that emanates from kind of this center point of um, sort of power or spirit for the whole Baroque architecture at the time. So if we look at this in the plan type, and this doesn't quite match up exactly, but it's pretty close to that, we're going to look at the, the massing from um, the southwest corner here. So we'll get nice light on it moving across the dome itself, because we could also draw this, but you end up seeing sort of the elevation that's, that's similar to what we've done at Maison Lafitte already. So every French architect learns from its precedents, and obviously Francois Mansart at Maison Lafitte was a precedent for, for uh, Valérie Comte here. So we'll come over to the spectacle that, that separates this from that culture, the uniqueness of the Oval Salon, and draw that as our point piece here. So like we've done before on domes, what we're gonna look for in value eventually uh, is that on the, the movement of this in three dimensions across the space, the sun will come down and hit a highlight point on the edge of the dome on top of that salon. And that'll wash out white and it'll make sort of that ball shape as you do value on either side of it. The rest is much more uh, similar to many things we've done so far based on orth orthogonal projection. And we see the very tall pitched roofs you find in Northern countries. So working with that, we'll start basically by doing our first box. And so we know that there's going to be a form that drives basically a very large scale three-story chateau. And sit kind of on a bit of a plinth raised up above that. So the vista is more distant. So by the time you're actually on the first floor, you're actually probably in, in uh, our terms, probably a story and a half high above the grade there. So you have more of a commanding view moving out toward the um, landscape that falls out in the rear garden. So at the base, we won't see the bottom of the box. We see the top at the piece coming across here. So we'll see a series of lines that are gonna come and break up the aspect of the moat, which will be beyond these lines. And then raising up from the moat are, are a series of terraces that bring you up and down from the main parlor of the space. So that's our plinth that the building set on. And then instead of having a pure box all the way around, you can see in the model form and the plan type here, there are separated volumes at the corners. So there's a movement in and around to kind of drive interest and in planar aspects around the, the skin of the building. So we'll do the one closest to us, which ends the box here and then breaks the space and comes out and finds its twin in the front. So they can complete this one, bring that down and then complete the one behind it. Come over opposite side, the other side of the dome, we'll go to the twin of this. Now it's ABA on the, on the landscape side, the garden side, down to the ground, it's pitched roof. And because they're twins, the top of each roof line will then meet as they go back to the right vanishing point. So in this case, for this particular sketch, since we're standing on the gravel path out here, which dips away from the building a little bit, our horizon line is probably right at the height of the first level of the, the stone barrier. So to indicate uh, somebody closer to the chateau over there, if they're walking up towards the stairs to get to the Grand Salon, it might be about that size relative to the, uh, the dominance of the, the mass of this building. 
So now we prepped the idea of the placement of this on axis now, our big dome while we're here. So if we simply run around the edges of those and drop them down, and on top is a cylindrical ring. So we bow that because it's well above the horizon line. And the base of that ring then sits on top of the dome. So that's bowed as well. And the cupola, vertical lines, and yet another dome on top of that. So that we see the underside of the dome and a bit of a detail on top of that. So the tops of all the, the squarish sort of residential part of this, that's this, the spectacle, are the high pitched roofs. Again, found more normatively up in the northern parts of France than you would find down in Southern Baroque architecture. And then obviously the vertical throws of the chimneys. Let's see a couple more here. The twins to these are on the other side, just very small. And then from the dome back toward the front entrance, there's a little pitch roof there, we'll see. Now, because it's still in um, Baroque's an extension of the Renaissance language, showing a little bit more power and might and, and political despotism in a sense. Um, the grandeur of this being the financial team still has the classical language to move us to the stages in the building. So one of the key ones here is that frontispiece that links the Grand Salon to the garden. So all eyes are on this space and how Laveau is going to move the classical language up to the top of that dome. So this solution, and we'll see this a little obliquely because it's in perspective and falling away from us, is a two-story language that comes up to the base of the pediment. So again, we have to rise up with the classical language here and show, in this case, four columns. And then they stop for their entablature and a bit of a cornice line, and then restart with three arches in between the space of the columns down below. And the Laveau uses Corinthian pilasters, so we'll see less of a shadow cast for those. So that's his system. Again, it'll there's so much variance to the language that it can apply to many different types of skins. So the idea was the classical language would rise up above the base of the dome. So um, that last cornice line is higher. It actually sits back onto the movement of the curve of the dome. And then when we come down to the edge of the wall itself, that will actually arc because there has to be an oval wall beneath it. And that'll come run up to the base of this two-story frontispiece. And then that line is taken all the way around the building as sort of the necking between the major two-story part of the chateau and then the roof element up above. So we can just simply follow that line. It steps down here because we're going around the corner and plan type pops back up from here Come on the other side and we'll see it there as well. So I have little tick marks for all the fenestration in there to give you uh, one side of it. So if you simply double those up, there are taller windows on the first floor, a little bit shorter on the second.
So that's enough because the subject's really about the massing and we'll show a little bit more detail towards our middle section third of this and we'll dissipate toward the edges. And then down below is the more of the servants quarter for it. So the natural light down there through smaller windows. But they follow the same pattern dropping down from the others. We'll see a little bit of the one behind the wall here. And then finally at the top, if you push that vertical thrust of the set of windows moving up, there's one that breaks the barrier of the skin of the roof. And those are gonna be oval windows that'll pop out through there. So we're sort of doing a disc in perspective to show those. And then carry down on top here. It's kind of a difficult compound move because the dome has to come in and, and marry into one of these pitched roofs over this interstitial neck between the oval, say, oval shape and the orthogonal corner. So what will happen is that roof, instead of coming angular down straight, it'll bow around there as it makes its way to that corner. So there's a flat roof that makes a very compound structural detail to support that interim space there. And maybe we'll see a little bit more here because probably right at this corner, it breaks right where this one breaks. And so you see the corner of that break line there on the other side of the dome. Now to help us with its placement, because um, when you when you take a tour of what we call they have a really interesting um, kind of lecture at the end of the tour that's all done uh, graphically, where they built a model of the entire site, where Vola de Comte itself is, if this is the size of the model, Vola de Comte might be this large on it, because they really want to talk about the whole landscape that it's more about the notre when you're done. It's about the architecture when you tour it, but the last thing you see coming out of the tour is this lecture about Andre Le Notre. So the the principle of the block is just set here, and you see the exposure to all the extent of the landscape, but you'll learn a lot through a slide presentation that's projected over on the base of the white model. So it can take you through seasons and through design principles, and it's a lovely way to understand the relationship between the three architects, three designers. So this sketch all really have is the background and then some of the stepping down to the land out here and eventually a little bit of line work, it'll carry us out on a series of terraces. But in terms of the background, we do have in the front, the, the gatehouses where the horses are stored, the entry level. And so there's a tone and value that's vertical back here on the other side of the moat, which wraps around the building. And then once we get to this part of it, we're actually looking at the forest. So the forest will come up right up to the edge of the home here. And so it provides a nice contrast to the stonework of the chateau when you run, run a dark against it. And then of course, all the, the darker tile up on the roofscape itself is a darker, darker tone of the stone. So we can wash, if we assume that it's, it's sort of um, a time and it's gonna light up this facade more than this corner, we wanna produce light on this thing. We'll say that the left side receives less light. So all those get toned out. The planes for all the chimneys. And then back here where it connects to the front of the building behind us a little bit, that little sliver that connects to the dome. And now the dome is, is rounding away from us. So on one end, it's actually further away than the ones that face the shade side over here. So it's darkest on this edge. So if you start with a wash, it kind of makes that more of a rotunda there. We'll do that again and keep spraying it, making it a bit lighter so that we end up having a bit of a shining ball of white as if the first part the sun hits closest to us will actually strike a white ball shape on the skin of the dome. And then to complete that, we want to come over to the other edge because it's against the white sky and bring value in there as well. And so that little quick 
uh, idea of how the, the, the sun is warming up part of a ball. You see the bright spot and it comes around to the depth of it when it goes around the edges of it. So we'll accent that later, but you start to get the sense of that's a different type of plane in space than these are because they're, they're, they're pyramidal, but they're two-dimensional planes, whereas these are three-dimensional planes moving around there. And we've done this before once or twice where we can make the cupola diaphanous because what will happen at the top is we're going to see, uh, to make it lightweight, this is our actual access to the roof deck to see the whole landscape up here. We'll drop down little fine arches. A triptych here, and they actually wrap around the whole space. What happens then is we see the, this cylinder that holds there roll around the other side of it. So under there, because we're so far beneath this, we'll see the dark underside, which makes that more of a three-dimensional volume up there. And then we'll see these panels that are bright here on our side go very dark once they wrap around the other side of them, the elements. So now we created kind of a nice three-dimensional piece on the top of the architecture up there, which rotates around as kind of a crowning element. And then the same type of thing here, it's the exact same type of dome, only smaller scale. We're gonna take it darker up to a point and make sure there's like a hot spot of light so dark around the edges here, but right there. So that little piece right there is reminiscent of this. And that's how we get that rotunda effect by using the sun's light. So now we can go back into the building proper. And this is our little technique of not just infilling a whole glazing area, but remember that they're all lighted and since they've got structural pieces. So it'll break down into a series of smaller pieces of dark within uh, showing the, the mutton work or the mullions that remain white in the building. So it's just kind of a sketch technique where we'll simply do two small and then two large strokes and kind of move that across the skin a little bit. And don't use the same pressure for a wall, kind of vary that so you create some interest. And the spaces as we move across the skin. Now, as you move further and further away, it becomes more oblique. You're not going to see all panels evenly because this is actually pitched around, so it's almost frontal for us. Certainly, when we come to the arches up here, we'll see a, a very little skin of dark because it's flattened out and away from us. And then even less further down here, a little strip of black is all you need at that distance. But now you get closer to us, we're back to our typical two panels that are the same size, a little bit larger beneath it. And once you use the Prismacolor long enough in one technique, you'll start to get that chiseled into it. So it'll give you a fatter play of your stroke line coming down. Let me turn the corner, it's a little bit less that you'll see. And then finally moving away from us. It's less important to detail this aspect because it's so far away. And again, the fact that you've done it a little bit here projects that idea for the viewer across the whole skin of the building. And the next step then is to change some of the planes between the left and right side. So this is a darker tone up top, but we still have less light if we assign it to the garden side, to this element on this side of the building will be a different tone. And we wanna make sure you wash that tone darkest right where it meets the light. So even though it's lighter than the roof element, it needs to gradate over to that certain point. And this will wash all the way down to the moat area. And it'll pick up this heavy stone wall here, which is much brighter in the foreground. Do the same for this piece where it's brightest, right where the sun's hitting the elevation next to it. Now run down to the moat area. And then we also wanna go dark next to the sky in the distance. So right at that edge, make it a little bit darker too. 
And so again, when you wash any type of elevation, just make sure you're going to animate it by having lights and darks within it and don't just simply color it in uh, monolithically. Okay, this piece in here, which is the same parallel plane as those will also be a value, but we can't make it the same because we have to build up this line stronger in that edge when it meets this plane behind it. So it'll start gray on one side and then wash to white and then turn gray again. That way we keep the, the indentation of that middle third there. And there's, because this is gonna go against the white of the sky, we'll take the shiny white roof up here that will make it darker toward that edge. We can take bits of this and make it a little bit darker towards our stonework beneath it. And now we'll look at all the, the pieces of classical architecture, which naturally cast their own shadows. So beneath the cornice line for each block and bar, there's a nice heavy shadow line. Then we can simply wrap that around the building. Over to our pediment piece. And the shadow of the pediment throws on the building adjacent to it. And then we need to wash, since this is a the base of a rotunda, it's also moving in a curvilinear form. So we want to wash movement across that. And now taking one of your other very uh, newly sharpened uh, pencils, we're going to come in and work some of the detail in this section of it to show the skin of the rest of the language that Laveau puts on the skin of the building. In this case, he's got um, engaged pilasters of Corinthian order. At the corner and then they turn and repeat over here. In this case, there'll just be three. A little bit of line work then starts to enunciate uh, the core of the, the values of this part now, because what Fouquet is doing, he's really kind of honoring his king by having a lot of money spent on this very powerful classical language Baroque building and a very decorative element, kind of claiming the seat of the best building in France for a while there. At the corners, there's in between the eyelet windows up here in the attic. Here in statuary, which rotate around on the south elevation. And then to help out kind of the pitch of the sun, if it's coming from this side, it would pitch a little bit of a darkness coming over this side of the pieces here, let's see a little bit more dark on that side of the metalwork. And now dropping down to the plane of the terracing, because again, we're up, even though it's the first floor of the building, it's, it's well above eye level for the next grade to get that projection across the landscape. We can come into the areas that are closer to the building and know the stone is washed in shade here. And then it faces the sun and it's washed in shade again. And then it faces the sun. There's a section, oh, about middle through that starts to uh, re relate to some of the structure of the moat running over here until we finally get to the bridge that takes us across and down. So that side will also be dark and it's twin on that side. So you start to see kind of the presence of the building stepping down toward the quality of the landscape. And so now to show the path work and to set the building down, we're going to come in and show the scale of some of the green versus the gravel. So very close to us is also a bit of the dry moat. So going down below the skin, there's a value in the plane that is always in perspective to our vanishing points. Then over in the distance, we see a little bit of the green space is even a darker color coming up in ribbons of space. And the true spectacle 
of the whole garden is actually coming to happen. So it's really out in this direction where when you're in the room overseeing this, you see the spectacle of water and green space and, and uh, access points and vistas that all kind of create this concert, almost like frozen music. So you see the performance of these things and the imagination of one another. So now we'll dive in and, and kind of do some more last little um, detailing here before we tell the story of what happens after Fouquet sort of dedicates this with an opening festival. So our key aspects are going to be always to uh, come into areas where we can give more value and pull the drawing out to hold its, its three-dimensional quality to us. And so this is the most important corner to us because it's closest to us. So we want to come to its edge and make the highest contrast in this segment of the building. So just to the edge, don't be ever uh, sort of singular and saying, I'm gonna cloak everything in the same tone across, always vary that. And then come to the edge in terms of the classical definition, what's happening there. And that'll run down to its base and project over and hold that line. And then in front of that is that great piece of stonework, which is brightly lit, it's got some, panels and berries along the way, which will set up the base to hold all that structure. And then we'll come around the corner a little bit and we can kind of lay off some of the value of it, but then it hits the sky over here. So that's a little bit crisp at this corner and then drop down to grade. And then maybe the lower part of our architecture in the background might receive a nice dark to kind of set that off. Because again, the eye is intrigued by going from dark to light to gray to dark to light to gray again. And that creates an interest for the subject to hold its information. And then because this is our closest corner, we should go back to the key windows that are closest to us and know that they're all set in the wall so we can do that upper cast shadow to show the depth of the stonework. And then stop because it's not that prominent over here in the distance, but certainly the ones that are closer to us. Uh, between the entablature here with the column, there's a nice cast shadow. And then to uh, enunciate some of the detail of stone work. The wall rises up at the cap of the wall, there is a stone rail detail, the last quarter about. So on top of all these, there's a little break. And so that little kind of squiggle for the balusters though, periodically, will kind of hint at that. There's a little more feature right to our center third of the drawing to articulate that. And then we have a little bit of fenestration. We're gonna, because it's such a bold tone, there are a lot of uh, shaped pieces of nature. So they'll take the species of tree or the bush and they'll use a really hard architectural geometrical form for it. So and they're separated at a, a routine element across the space. So in front of this area here, there will be an evergreen, a pine shape on the ground and then a walkway around that and then over here it repeats and it starts the mastery of man and nature and the relationship of bringing bringing into the part of the mathematics of the architecture the landscape designs themselves become more mathematical so these two are twin then on the other side of the chateau equidistant from the main spine. So in the distance here, these even come down in perspective and we see that twin at that distance. And now this twin would be about that far away. So now the four are part of the introduction to how Lenoche is gonna treat the rest of the landscape and the forest area that, he, that Fouquet bought into in the 1660s. So a last little bit here, because we also want to make sure that this is our star, we'll come back in and make one of our darker areas around the edge of that white. 
the darker that gets, the brighter that hot spot is. So you see the prominence of the sun being just as important as the pencil. And a little more definition to the chimney tops that are closer to us, more of a profile. More attention to the cast shadow underneath the top of the cupola. And to the dome. We'll leave the um, sky off of this one because it's pretty prominent by itself with the big floating dome on top of the orthogonal place below. So the sort of the crowning story of this, which makes it a little more emphatic in terms of the history of Fouquet on the site, is um, when he wanted to open this up, like it took obviously years to build and the inauguration was going to have famous Jean LaFontaine, will he ever gonna be there? Great um, classical events with language, literature, fine feasts. And it was a three day event and it was meant to be impress the king and to be an honor of the king because obviously this was part of the king's spoils that Fouquet had the ability to build this. What happened was it backfires, just like it sounds like he went too far using the king's funds. It was actually too impressive and too luxurious. So Colbert, who was the king's minister, convinced him that it was a misappropriation of public funds. So this is how Voltaire wrote about the three-day weekend. On August 17th at six in the evening, Fouquet was the king of France. At two in the morning, he was nobody. Imprisoned for the rest of his life, and that story goes in some popular culture and sort of a um, little bit inventiveness, but Alexander Dumas wrote a novel called The Man in the Iron Mask. And they, they, he, he supposed the notion was that he wasn't put to death, but wearing an iron mask would at least show your identity in your prison sentence. So part of the tour at the base of Volley Comte before you, you see that aspect of Lenotre's garden is a wax figurine of an imprisoned Fouquet in the basement. 